welcome and thank you for joining. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Rani, and I'm going to make a very bold statement right now. And that bold statement is that this hour that we're going to be spending together is going to be the most important hour that you will invest in taking care of your precious eyes. And I say that because I hope what you will learn today will transform your eye health and your overall health as well. Um, it'll change the way you think about your vision, about um, what you do to take care of your vision, and it will also help you make some healthy choices in terms of, um, again, your vision health for the years ahead. So um, uh, you'll benefit from this webinar. For example, if you've been suffering from eye symptoms, such as irritation, burning, redness, dryness, tearing, scratchiness, grittiness. So I'll talk about what all these symptoms are, what they mean, and what you can do about them. And also you'll benefit from this webinar if you've had trouble reading fine print, which I know many of us have, uh, myself included. If you've suffered from eye strain or eye fatigue, especially from being on screens, because most of us are now uh, working off screens. Um, many of us are doing education on, on uh, online as well. So uh, we're on screens for quite a bit of the day. And also you'll benefit from this webinar if you're experiencing light sensitivity, because I'm going to be giving you some basic, simple solutions or, or strategies to manage all of these types of issues. Now, finally, you'll also benefit from this webinar if, if maybe you haven't had any of those eye symptoms, but if you simply, if you value your eyesight, if you value your vision, and you want to be proactive, you want to be doing whatever you can to maintain the vision that you have to keep your eyesight strong and healthy for the future going ahead. So you can continue doing all those things you love to do, whether it be reading, driving, working, using a device, or simply just seeing the faces of your friends and loved ones. Um, what I'm going to be teaching you today will put you on the right track to doing all those things and keeping your eyes healthy. So um, actually, let me just go back one slide. So uh, before we actually get into the um, the the content of the webinar, I just want to go over some basic housekeeping items with you. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be spending um, some time together, about an hour. Now, I actually gave this webinar twice already this week. I gave this webinar on Monday and Wednesday, and um, it actually went longer than an hour. It went for about 90 minutes because people had so many amazing questions, and there was just so much content I wanted to share. So I, I cut it down a bit. I'm going to really try to keep it down to an hour. I may go over just a little bit, and I would really, really, really love for you to stay with me till the end, uh, because at the end, I'm going to be sharing some really important important information. And also, if you can stay till the very, very end, I have two special gifts for you, uh, for the people who can stay on. Again, I understand everyone's busy, you know, maybe you're tuning in from work, or maybe it's, you know, family time, wherever you are. But if you can just spend this time with me, I would very much appreciate it. The second um, housekeeping item I wanted to mention is that um, I will be dividing this webinar into three parts. And at the end of each part, I will give a little bit of opportunity for Q&A. So if you have a question pertaining to that part of the webinar, the content, uh, please ask your Q&A then. Uh, if you do have other questions, or maybe you thought of something later on that you didn't get a chance to ask, I will be also holding Q&A at the very end as well. So uh, try to ask it right after the that specific part or wait till the end and then you can ask your questions then. And I promise I will stay on as long as necessary to get as many questions as possible answered that you have, uh, because I do want to, to you know, this webinar to, for it to be um, not just a, a, a lecture uh, type, I do want it to be more interactive. So I would love for you to ask your questions along the way and then at the end as well. Um, now, uh, related to that, I also wanted to just um, the last housekeeping item I wanted to mention is that because this is a webinar, this is for educational purposes only. So based off of this webinar, I cannot diagnose anyone with any specific eye condition or any other condition based off of this webinar. And I certainly cannot treat anyone based off of this webinar. I will be providing you with a lot of information that you can take, and hopefully that information will empower you to make the right choices or maybe have a discussion with your personal eye doctor. But unless I am your doctor and unless we have a doctor-patient relationship, I cannot diagnose anyone or treat anyone based off of a webinar alone. So, um, so that being said, if you do ask any questions, please uh, recognize that I can't answer any personal questions. For example, if you say, oh, you know, Dr. Rani, I have this pain in my eye. I really don't know what's causing it. 
I can't really address that. If you have a general question, like what causes pain, that I can answer. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about what questions you'd like to ask during the webinar. Um, I will keep the chat uh, box open. So uh, periodically, I will take a look and try to um, uh, keep things going. Um, if you do also have questions, um, please either enter them into the chat box or into the Q&A. If you raise your hand, I may not see it. So please just you know, keep to either the chat box or the Q&A box. So with that, um, let's begin. So uh, just a little bit of background about me, if you don't know me, if you've never met me before. Uh, my name is Dr. Rani Banik. My full name is Rudrani Banik. I'm a board certified ophthalmologist and I'm also a fellowship trained neuro-ophthalmologist. Uh, I run a private practice based in New York City called Envision Health, and I'm also an associate professor of ophthalmology, uh, where I teach and I do research at New York Ioneer at Mount Sinai in New York City. And uh, I, I'm dating myself here a bit, but I've been practicing, I've been doing ophthalmology for over 24 years. So in that span of time, I've just about seen it all and done it all in terms of taking care of people's eyes. Um, so uh, in addition to my traditional training in ophthalmology, I also have additional training in integrative and functional medicine. Um, if you've never heard of integrative or functional medicine before, it's really um, a way to approach chronic disease by trying to get at the root cause, what's really causing the problem rather than to just put a Band-Aid on the problem. And, um, and really I try to tie in eye health with the rest of the body because the eye is so closely uh, related to the health of the rest of our body. So it's a very holistic a way to approach eye health. And as part of um, practicing integrative and functional medicine, I do use a lot of nutritional strategies in my treatment protocol calls nutrition and lifestyle strategies. And sometimes I also use botanicals, essential oils, and even supplements when appropriate. So it's really, again, a very holistic way of thinking about vision and eye health. And um, I've been very fortunate in my, uh, in my years of doing this to be able to share my message with people on, on uh, various different media channels, on social media as well. And uh, fortunately, I've been uh, featured on Good Morning America, New York Times, and many other stations and radio stations, um, as well as a guest on over 60 podcasts. So my goal is really to share this message with the world that um, our vision, uh, even though many of us take our vision for granted, we shouldn't, because we need to do things proactively to take care of our vision. So my mission is uh, to let people know, to make them aware that vision is a priceless gift. We shouldn't take it for granted. And we need to be proactive about protecting and preserving it. So again, that's really what I practice. That's what I preach um, uh, in, in all respects, whether it's when I teach, whether it's when I see patients, uh, what I share on social media, et cetera. So um, let's talk now about eye changes that can happen as we get older. Now, over the years, I've taken care of thousands of people with um, vision changes. And sometimes these aging or age-related eye changes develop when people hit their 40s. Sometimes it develops a little bit later, maybe 50s, 60s, and sometimes even a bit sooner. Sometimes these vision changes develop in, develop in one's 30s. And I do really think it's important for people to be aware of what these problems are. So they can basically um, uh, almost try to stop them in their tracks if possible, or, or just be aware of what they are so they can manage them better. So they don't have you know, a sudden sense of, um, you know, I just can't see, I can't function well. Um, people, some of my patients, they get very anxious when they suddenly have vision problems if they can't focus properly, if they're really suffering with uh, dryness or, or irritation of their eyes. Sometimes their whole world just you know, shuts down because their eyes are not working properly. And what I'm here to share with you today is that um, a lot of these age-related eye changes can be prevented if you take the right steps. So what I'm going to um, go through are three common uh, age-related eye changes that happen. Uh, and these three things are um, dry eye, uh, difficulty focusing up close, and presbyopia. So um, these three things, again, dry eye, presbyopia, um, sorry, I, I misspoke. Dry eye, difficulty focusing up close, which is presbyopia, and eye strain along with light sensitivity. So these are the three topics I'm gonna be talking about today. And I'm gonna be sharing with you what I call my insight tips. And I'm gonna share with you six insight tips to manage these, these three various things. So two tips for each of these conditions. And if you, um, if you haven't yet, 
please download the worksheet that goes along with today's webinar. So you can, you know, hopefully you have it in front of you. You can um, follow along. You can uh, take notes if you need to. And if you, uh, I'm going to ask my staff to just drop the worksheet into the chat box. So please uh, just go ahead and share the worksheet. Again, if you haven't um, printed it out or if you don't have access to it right now, no worries. You can always print it out later and everyone will get a replay link for this webinar. So even if, you know, I'm going to share a lot of information, you can always go back and watch the replay and take notes and kind of develop a, a roadmap for yourself, for yourself, some strategies and what you can do to be proactive about your vision. Now, um, why did I choose these three specific topics? You know, there are many different top things that can happen as we get older. For example, in addition to these three things, uh, people may also develop uh, uh, blurred vision due to cataracts, they may develop glaucoma or macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. These are other age-related eye issues that can happen. So why did I choose these three? It's because I myself have experienced all three of these things. And I've gone through what many, many, many of my patients experience. So I've had the same challenges that I've kind of worked through. And I'm very fortunate because being an eye doctor, I know what's going on and I know what my options are to take care of these issues. However, most people don't know what all of their options are. So another one of my goals is not just to educate you about these things, but to give you some options um, in terms of different tiers of treatment, different levels of treatment. So what I'm gonna be sharing with you is really the base level tier one, but there's also tier two and tier three in terms of treatment options that you can explore if you have the knowledge. And so again, I'm gonna be sharing with you, you know, when I had dry eye, it was horrible. Um, I, I, I wear contacts. I couldn't even keep my contacts in. Uh, my eyes would get so dry. Uh, sometimes as soon as I got home, I had to take my contacts out and rinse and lubricate my eyes. And then at nighttime, sometimes my eyes were so dry that they would stick together. I couldn't even open them in the morning. And it was very, very painful to even open my eyes. So maybe you've had some of these symptoms. And again, because I know what I could do to take care of it, you may not know what you do. And so that's really the purpose of why I'm sharing with you these specific three eye issues. So let's go on now to the first eye issue, which is dry eye. Now, just put into the chat, just so everybody can kind of share um, if you've had any of those three issues. So I'm gonna continue talking, but you can also share some of your experiences maybe with some of these conditions as we go along, You know, what types of symptoms you've had and maybe some things you've tried uh, to take care of these symptoms. But let's first talk about dry eye. So what is dry eye? Well, as the name implies, dry eye is when the surface of the eye called the cornea uh, dries out. It becomes very um, irregular. Um, it uh, doesn't necessarily uh, allow light beams to come into the eye clearly. And so, um, so vision may not be clear. And basically what's happening is that in dry eye, our natural tears that we produce are not providing adequate lubrication. And there are many reasons for dry eye, which I'll kind of I'll go through, but that's the bottom line is the surface dries out because the tears are simply not sufficient to lubricate the eyes. Now, um, uh, dry eye is very, very common. It's estimated that it affects about 50 million people just in the United States alone. So if you extrapolate that number, there's probably well over a billion people in the world who have dry eye. It is more common as people get older. Um, and actually, you know, if I happen to see a patient who's in their 60s or 70s and they don't have dry eye, that's more the exception because the majority of people in those age, age groups do have dry eye. It is more common in women, and I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go along. However, all that being said, dry eye can happen at any age. It can happen in children, uh, especially children when they're on screens for prolonged periods of time. Uh, for example, my daughter, who's now a teenager, uh, during the height of the pandemic, when she was on screens doing online learning, she suffered from pretty um, uh, significant dry eye at a point because she, her eyes were just so fatigued and tired out from staring at a screen all day. Uh, dry eye can also happen in men. So it's not just an exclusive female issue. Uh, men can develop it as well. Actually, I had a patient just earlier today also who had very, very severe dry eye, and he's in his uh, mid-70s. So just to kind of um, illustrate a little bit of about dry eye, I'm going to share with you a patient story. Um, so this is Susie. Uh, she's 52 years old. She's very, very healthy. She takes very good care of herself. And she came in because she had some unusual symptoms. She'd never had these symptoms before. She was worried about them. Her eyes really began to burn. 
they felt like they were on fire. Um, and it got to the point where she couldn't even keep her eyes open. She, you know, her eyes were burning so much. She just had to keep them closed most of the time. She became extremely light sensitive and she also had trouble driving. She just could not go out, especially during the daytime when it was sunny. She could not keep her eyes open. She did not feel safe to drive anymore. So when I saw Susie, you know, I did an intake on her and, um, and it turned out that she was being 52, she was perimenopausal. And so she was going through some hormonal changes at the time. And, um, and that those hormonal changes basically coincided with when a lot of her vision changes started to develop or her eye symptoms started to develop. So there was a clue there as to what could be the root cause of her dry eye. But let's just talk a little bit about the symptoms first before I come back to Susie and what I ended up recommending for her. So in terms of symptoms, she had some of the classic, classic symptoms of dry eye. She had burning, she had irritation, her eyes felt scratchy, like there was sand in them or pebbles in them. They felt very gritty. And she just constantly, she just wanted to rub her eyes and just try to get some of that uh, sandy grittiness out of her eyes, or she would try to flush out her eyes with saline. It helped somewhat, but not fully. Um, she also developed some redness of the eyes and the redness in dry eye can either happen on the surface of the eye like we see here, or sometimes the eyelids can get red and swollen as well as what we see here. You can see this person's uh, eyelids are a little bit swollen. There's some uh, really prominent blood vessels. And, um, and this is uh, very, again, very, very common in people who have dry eye. Um, and then also dry eye can cause blurry vision. And some people may not realize this is that when their eyes get dry, the light rays that come into the eye, if the eye is not smooth, the surface is not smooth, those rays get scattered in all different directions. And so they don't necessarily focus onto the back of the eye very well. And because those light rays are scattered, it causes blurred vision. And this type of blurred vision that can happen with dry eye comes and goes. So it's intermittent blurry vision. It's not constant, it comes and goes. And also it can vary depending on the time of day. So for some people, they wake up with dry eye, very like I did, you know, my story that I shared with you, they wake up with dry eye and their symptoms are worse in the very early morning and they kind of get worse as the day, as they get better as the day goes on versus other people, they don't wake up with dry eye, but they develop dry eye as the day progresses. And by the evening time, they just can't even focus anymore. Their eyes are so blurry and irritated. Um, and it's just because they've just been probably in many cases, looking at a screen all day. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So um, the other common symptom of dry eye is tearing. Now, many people say, well, Dr. Rani, that just doesn't make sense. If my eye is dry, why is it tearing? So let me explain that contradiction to you. When the eye gets dry, the surface of the eye gets dry, the tear glands, the biggest tear gland is right here underneath, underneath your upper lid. This tear gland gets a signal that the eye is dry, so it overproduces tears. And so the tearing occurs in response to the dryness. So if you can fix the dryness, if you can correct the dryness, it will then prevent the tearing. So again, there's kind of like a, um, uh, it's not a chicken or egg situation, it's actually initially the dryness that causes the tearing. So keep that in mind. Um, now, going, going back to Susie here. So when I took a look at her under the microscope, now, you know, us, we eye doctors, we have lots of technical equipment. We have very high-tech equipment, but this is one of our basic pieces of equipment is a microscope. As so we look at people's eyes under the microscope. And what we do is we put a dye in, and this dye is like a fluorescent yellowish green dye. Maybe if you've been to the eye doctor, you probably have this dye put in your eyes. But basically, uh, this dye coats the surface of the eye and it lets us examine the cornea and, uh, and see if the cornea is healthy or not, if it's dry or not. So this on the left here, this picture is a healthy cornea with, you can see the dye here, it's nicely coating the surface of the eye. And this is a picture of what Susie's eye looked like. So she has all of these areas of bright fluorescent green. And this green dye is picked up by the cornea in areas of dryness. So it basically stains, we call it staining, and it shows us where the areas of dryness are. Now in Susie's case, her dryness was more on the mild to moderate side. Um, however, there can be cases of, of dry eye in which there's much more significant staining. You can see here, this person's um, eye is really full of all of these greenish dots, which is representative of where it's, it's very, very dry. This person has very significant dryness on the bottom, the bottom half, as well as a little bit on the top as well, with some sparing in the middle. 
And this person's dry eye is very, very severe. There's basically staining throughout the entire cornea. And so, um, so this is the way that we can determine dry eye on our exam. There's obviously other things we look at other than just the, the staining, but that's the basic thing we look for. So now I'm gonna give you my first insight tip on how to manage dry eye. The number, number one thing is you need to lubricate. And not just put in drops, you know, maybe once a day or once every couple of days, you need to lubricate aggressively because dry eye is similar to dry skin. When your skin gets dry, you know, you lubricate and sometimes you have to lubricate, especially during drier months of the year, you have to lubricate frequently several times a day. You have to keep putting lotion on or, or cream on to lubricate. Eyes are very similar. You can't just put in drops once a day and assume that that drop is gonna last you all day long. So what I typically recommend, depending on the severity of the dryness, is to put in the drops several times a day and at least, you know, just for someone starting out with mild dry eye, at least three, maybe even four times a day. Okay, so that's, that's my very first in, um, insight tip is to lubricate aggressively. Now. The biggest question is, Dr. Rani, that I get is, Dr. Rani, which drop should I use? Because I go to the store and I see there are shelves and shelves and shelves of all of these drops, over-the-counter drops. Is one better than the other? Which one should I use? Well, what I'll tell you is that there are many brands on the market. For example, in the United States, there's Refresh, there's Sustain, there's Genteel, there's Theratiers, there's Blink. Um, for the most part, they're all safe and they're all relatively equivalent. So it doesn't really matter which of these you get. There are different levels within the drops and, and um, I'm gonna share that with you at the end of the webinar today about specifically about drops, but um, different types of drops depending on you know how severe the dry eye is or whether you have eye strain or not, a digital eye strain or not, or whether you have um, another condition that affects the glands that I'm gonna show you some pictures of. There are different levels of dry eye drops, but in general, all of these brands are fairly equivalent. But what I will tell you is that there are some common mistakes people make with their dry eye drops. Number one is that they go and they get Visine. And Visine is marketed as a drop to, at least in the US, it's marketed as a drop to get the red out. What I'll tell you is that um, Visine is not my preference for dry eye, as well as most eye doctors will tell you, do not put in Visine for dry eye, because what it, it has is, is it has an ingredient that constricts the blood vessels, and that's how it gets the red out. But that ingredient is not good to use long-term, because let's say you use it every single day or several times a day to keep your eyes nice and white. Um, what happens is when you stop using it, your blood vessels will dilate significantly, and it almost causes like a rebound redness. It actually makes things worse. So I typically tell my patients, avoid Visine for dry eye. The second thing I tell my patients is avoid an ingredient called BAK. B-A-K is a preservative that's used in many, many eye drops. If you look at the ingredients on the bottle, if you see it says BAK, you probably want to avoid that ingredient. And the last ingredient I strongly recommend you avoid is polyvinyl alcohol. So if you turn the bottle around, you see the ingredients, if it says anything with alcohol in it, please do not buy it. And the reason is because this ingredient, polyvinyl alcohol, is used in many generic eye drops. It's very cheap. And so that's why a lot of generics will use it. But that polyvinyl alcohol, when you put it on your eye, it is not pH balanced to your eye. So in many cases, patients have burning. Plus I've seen that that polyvinyl alcohol actually in many of my patients makes things worse. It actually causes them worse dry eyes. So it's really horrible. It's un very unfortunate that this is on the market because it's something that people think, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I have this artificial tear, I'm doing my eyes some good, but it actually can make things worse. So if you see that ingredient on your bottle, please just throw it out. I know it's cheap, it's, you know, it's affordable, but it's not good for your eyes. So just throw out that polyvinyl alcohol. Um, instead, maybe use one of the other brands that I showed you earlier. Now, um, as I was mentioning earlier, put the drops in several times a day and not just once a day, but so, you know, almost basically every single day. And then once your dry eye feels better, then you can uh, ease back on the frequency uh, of your drops. So maybe you know, during certain months of the year, you wanna use it three or four times a day, but then other months of the year, you wanna back off and maybe just use it once or twice a day. You can do that as well. Um, so um, the second insight tip I have for you 
and um, this is really, really important for dry eye, is that uh, we have little tiny glands on the inside of our lids, just by close to where our eyelashes come out. And if you look, at, look closely in the mirror, you'll see that there are little tiny dots, and those are actually the openings of the glands in your eyelids. And your, those glands produce oils. And those oils are really important to keep the tears from evaporating on the surface of your eyes. So if those glands are not healthy and if they're not secreting healthy oils, your tears will evaporate. And so um, on exam, as an eye doctor, we always look for blocked glands and we call this meibomian gland dysfunction. And you can see here in this picture that this gland is full of this kind of whitish material that should not look like that. Normally the oil, a healthy oil on the, with a, within a gland should be clear. It should have a beautiful clear color. If we press on the lid, it should flow nice and, and smoothly. It should coat the eye. This is an, an example of when the gland is not healthy. It's producing unhealthy oils that will make your tears evaporate and cause dry eye. So you need to keep your glands healthy. And what's the best way to do this? Well, the number one best way to do this is to use hot compresses. And um, that will help to uh, keep the oils uh, flowing. Um, and, and so they don't, the oil glands don't get plugged up. They don't um, uh, get clogged and you don't get infections or styes. For example, so many people get styes who have dry eyes and it's because those glands are getting plugged up. So keep your glands healthy. How can you do this? The easiest thing is using a hot compress. And many of my patients will say, well, Dr. Ronnie, you know, I, I put a, a, a face towel under the, um, under hot water. I put that on my eyes. Isn't that enough? And I tell them, no. That is not enough because that face towel will not retain the heat. You want to use something that will keep the heat for a long period of time. And what I mean by long period of time is five to 10 minutes, because if you just use a hot towel within a minute or so, it starts to lose its heat, its heat and then you have to run it under the hot water again. So instead, I recommend using a, 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 a compress that has beads inside. We call these moisture beads and these beads can retain the heat for longer periods of time. So um, these compresses, you can just put in the microwave, heat them up for 10, 15 seconds, then put them on your eyes and that heat will be retained for about five to 10 minutes. And in some patients, they have to do this multiple times a day. If they have severe meibomian gland issues, oil gland issues, they need to do it like at least twice a day, sometimes even three times a day. So that is uh, one of my major, major tips for dry eye uh, is to use that type of a hot compress. The other thing that many patients ask me about are tea bags. You know, can I just take a tea bag and a hot tea bag and put that on my eyelid? Well, first of all, um, that tea bag just make sure, first of all, it doesn't burn your skin because sometimes people do end up burning their eyelid. But that tea bag also won't retain the heat for very long. Um, maybe it'll stay warm for maybe a minute or two or three, but then after that, it starts to lose its heat. So you want to use something that's really going to retain the heat. And um, another thing, if you don't have hot compresses, uh, I would recommend you can use it. May sound a little bit strange. Is a potato. You can take a medium or small sized potato. Heat it up, whether you put it in the microwave, you put it on the stove, you heat it up, and you take that potato, you wrap it in a towel, you put it on your eye, and that will retain the heat for much, much longer. So that's a great hack that I love to share with my patients. I actually um, used that hack of using the hot potato when I was, um, I had a lot of styes right after I, I, um, I was pregnant. And uh, again, my oil glands were not working well uh, due to hormonal changes during pregnancy. So I used that potato trick and it worked so well. I had about seven styes uh, right after I delivered. And so that would really help those my styes to drain and help keep my glands healthy. So it may sound a little bit strange, but that potato does work. Um, okay. So now getting back to Susie, um, so uh, I did a pretty extensive um, intake on her and I found that she had two root causes of her dry eye. She had MGD, which is that meibomian gland dysfunction, and she also had um, hormonal issues. So she had low levels of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone that were contributing to her dry eye. So what was my treatment recommendation to her? Well, first of all, she was only using drops a few times a week. So I told her, you need to level up on your eye drop use. So I gave her uh, um, very thick 
basic lubricating drops to use every two hours initially for the first two weeks. And then we backed off on the drops, but she immediately started to feel better. I taught her how to do hot compresses properly. And then um, ultimately, because she actually had a lot of gland issues, I ended up recommending for her for her uh, a more advanced treatment for dry eye, which is called Lipiflow, to really reset those glands and get the oils functioning or, or flowing properly. And then finally, for her hormonal issues, I ended up prescribing her compounded eye drops uh, with hormones in them uh, to um, basically restore their hormonal changes that were happening. You know, she was devoid of hormones for her eyelids. So that helped to restore that. So with that, um, she did much, much, much better. She's doing really well right now. And she's just done maintenance therapy for now. And she's, um, she's really uh, back to really her normal eye function that was so affected when she had very severe dry eye. So I'm going to pause for a moment and ask if anyone has any questions about dry eye. Um, I do want to keep going. I, I know I'm kind of watching the time and a little bit over half an hour already. And I still have two more topics to go over with you. So if you have a quick question about dry eye, please drop it into the chat. Um, I think there's a Q&A over here. What causes MGD? Great question. Um, I wish we had an answer for that. Um, you know, in some people, um, it could simply be getting older, but not everybody, because um, some people I've seen who are in their 70s and 80s and have healthy glands. So age is not the answer. Um, other people, it could be autoimmune diseases. For example, I've had patients with uh, autoimmune conditions like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis um, or other types of um, autoimmune conditions like Sjogren's syndrome who have very significant MGD. Um, and so there's some inflammation going on there as well. And in other patients, I've even seen teenagers with significant meibomian gland dysfunction. So it's not just an age-related thing. It's not just, you know, um, uh, a medical issue. Sometimes it's hormonal changes. Sometimes it's uh, maybe access screen time. We don't fully understand what causes dry eye for, or MGD leading to dry eye for everyone. So um, I know that there's another question, but I'm going to ask you to hold that question because I do want to keep going. I don't want to uh, go too long today and I try to try to stay on time. So the next um, eye issue I'm going to be explaining to you is presbyopia. So what is presbyopia? Well, uh, let me first explain to you what happens when we focus up close, and then I'll explain to you what presbyopia is. So when we're looking at something at a distance, um, our, um, our eye adjusts to that distance, that viewing distance. Um, and then when we look at something closer, for example, if we're looking at our computer screen, which is at intermediate distance, or if we're looking at reading something, maybe, you know, a newspaper or looking at our phone, that's up close. Our eye changes focus depending on which distance we're looking at. And um, basically, when we're looking at far distance, the light rays that come into the eye come in parallel. And then the eye the lens inside the eye focuses those light rays onto the back of the eye to get a clear, crisp, sharp image. However, when we're looking at something up close, those light rays coming from that target are diverging. So our eyes have to converge those rays to get them to focus onto the back of the eye. So this is a little bit of optics I'm trying to explain here, uh, basic optics of the eye. But basically, the lens inside the eye has to change shape in order for us to focus at various different distances. And that process of changing shape when we're looking for far away to up close is called accommodation. And what happens is that as we get older, our ability to accommodate decreases. And uh, that decrease in ability to accommodate or to change the, the shape of the lens to focus up close is called presbyopia. And uh, what I'll tell you is that um, Presbyopia is very, very common, uh, and I'll, I'll give you some numbers in a moment, but it causes people to suddenly notice that up-close objects are blurry. So if they try to read, if they try to use their phone or a tablet, it's blurry, it's not crisp, or if they try to do any kind of near task, especially some fine um, work, for example, threading a needle or doing some kind of craft uh, um, um, craft that requires really close focusing, it's really hard to see up close. So that's what the symptom of presbyopia uh, is. And um, why does it develop? It's because the lens inside the eye, we think, becomes more stiff as we get older. It can't dynamically change its shape to focus at different distances. And, um, and ultimately, it causes the symptom of trouble reading up close. And people have to 
end up holding things further and further away from their face to focus well. So that's a symptom that I get a lot of the time is Dr. Rani, my arms are just no longer long enough to see up close and I need help. So I'm gonna share um, the story of another patient of mine, Michelle, just to demonstrate or illustrate a little bit more about presbyopia and some options for treatment for presbyopia. So Michelle is 37 years old. Um, she doesn't look 37. She actually looks much younger than 37, but she's 37. She's very healthy. She's very proactive about her, uh, her health. She uh, is very careful about her diet. She exercises. She's in great shape. She's never had vision issues in her life. Uh, she said, I've always had 20-20 vision since I was a kid. I never wore glasses. But all of a sudden, and she said, it seemed like as soon as she hit 37, she could no longer focus up close. It was almost like something happened overnight. And uh, what ended up happening was that she was having such trouble focusing. Most of her day was on a screen. Um, she was working remotely. And she also, she, she had trouble focusing on the screen, but also when she tried to uh, shift from the screen to her phone, she couldn't read well on her phone. It was very, very blurry. And again, she just kept having to hold it further and further away from her. So she said, Dr. Rani, I don't know why this is happening to me. Like, wh what, what's going on with my eyes? Am I going to go blind? She was really scared. She was really, really worried about this sudden change in her vision. And what I explained to her is, Michelle, don't worry. This is actually something normal that happens. And it's a normal part of the aging process. Just like eventually, most of us, almost all of us will get wrinkles. Um, I explained to her, most of us will develop this problem with our um, lens in our eye where we can't accommodate well, and uh, we develop this condition called presbyopia. So it happens to almost everyone. That's what I told her. So, um, but the good news is there are some excellent, excellent options for how to treat presbyopia. So even though, you know, you're having so much difficulty reading, there are options for you to get you back. Um, the crisp, clear vision you used to have when you were younger. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened there. I don't know. All of a sudden. I don't know how that happened, but let's go back forward. Okay, so um, so I explained to her that presbyopia can begin um, uh, in one's 40s or 50s, and um, but some people people do get it earlier than that. And as we get older, the degree of presbyopia also increases. And so I told her, don't worry, it may actually get worse before it stabilizes. Um, but th again, there are lots of options to treat you. So presbyopia is, again, it happens to almost everyone. At least 1.3 billion people in the world have some degree of presbyopia. Um, that's estimated. I'm sure that that number is probably much, much higher. And unfortunately, a lot of people in the world don't have access to treat it. And most of us here in the U.S. are pretty fortunate that we have options to treat our presbyopia. And um, I, um, I also um, want to just emphasize that it usually begins in one's early 40s. About 60% of people develop presbyopia starting in their early 40s. But some people, it may not develop until their 50s or even 60s. But definitely by their late 50s, early 60s, most people have some issues reading up close. But other people as early as their mid-30s have presbyopia. Um, there's actually a chart that we use in terms of determining how much loss of accommodation there is, how much does that lens lose its ability to stay supple and flexible. And um, basically, this is a, a general chart that we use in, um, in the eye care space, whether you're an ophthalmologist or optometrist. Um, uh, between age 40 to 42, people need some magnification of 0.75 or so. And that number goes up as we get older, by the mid-150s, usually 1.75 or 2. And then eventually, at some point, that number stabilizes. So it's not that it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so usually, it stabilizes by one's late 50s, early 60s. And you may end up needing plus 250, or at the most, usually plus 3 is kind of where most people um, max out uh, between 250 and 3. Now, what I'll tell you is that these numbers um, can be applied if 
somebody does not have any other power, uh, um, underlying power of their eyes. But for example, if you're nearsighted or if you're myopic, let's say you have a power of minus four, then you have to add this number to that minus four to figure out what power do you need for reading up close. So for example, if you're minus four and you're, let's say, 44 years old, you're going to need a minus three for, for up close. So minus four for distance, minus three for up close. Or let's say you're a plus two. If you're a plus two and uh, now you're 50 years old, you have to add some extra plus to that to be able to read up close. So let's say you're a plus two, you have to add about 1.75. So then that ends up being that you need a 3.75 for reading. So um, again, if you have just uh, no prescription whatsoever, you can probably just go to the local your local drugstore and pick up some over-the-counter reading glasses. That's my insight tip number three is you just need to go and find what power is clearest for you for the distance you like to read. So the closer you hold something, you're going to need a higher power. The further away you hold something to read, you're going to need a lower power magnification. This is the, this is again, for people who don't have a prescription, if you do have a prescription already, for example, if you wear glasses already for driving or distance, or if you already wear reading glasses, then you have to add that magnification power on top. Or if you have astigmatism, you have to take that astigmatism into account as well when you're calculating what you need for reading for presbyopia. Um, the other insight tip for presbyopia I have is it's very simple these days to adjust the settings on your devices to be able to increase the font size so you can read easier and more comfortably uh, on your device. So for example, I have a pretty um, a big font size on my phone and my daughter makes fun of me for it, but it helps me function. Otherwise, you know, with my presbyopia, I also wear um, pro uh, progressive contact lenses or multifocal contacts to help me with my presbyopia. But, um, but there are lots of device hacks and tricks that you can um, use. There are also lots of apps on your devices to help with presbyopia. For example, if you're reading, uh, if you're in a, in, a, in a restaurant and you're having trouble reading the menu, there are apps to help you read that menu. Let's say you forgot your reading glasses at home. There's lots of um, ways to get around that. And then in terms of lighting, uh, lighting is very important. So uh, the lighting should be basically um, directed at your reading material. Uh, and so I typically tech recommend to my patients that they put their lighting behind them so that it's coming from behind and it's on your reading material. Some people have their lighting coming from straight up top, which is not great because it's not directed at the reading material, or they have it from behind, which basically just causes glare. So just think about, you know, if you have presbyopia, how is your workstation configured? Um, maybe adjust your lighting and you'll see that there's going to be a lot of benefit to just making some small changes. So um, now the fortunate thing is we have in the past two years or so, or a little bit more than that, we have some great options now for presbyopia that did not exist before. There's actually uh, a prescription eye drop um, that, the, that is FDA approved for presbyopia, which you may have seen commercials on television for this. It's called Vuity um, that can be used. Now there's a pros and cons for Vuity and um, Again, I don't have time today to go into all those pros and cons, but it may be appropriate for some patients. And then also there are now surgeries that can be uh, done for presbyopia. Now, surgery is not an option for everyone. And in some patients, I tell them, you know, that's a last resort option. If nothing else is working for you, then maybe there can be a surgery that can really help you function better for reading um, or seeing anything up close. So, uh, but there are some really great options for surgery. And I think more and more eye care providers are gonna be recommending surgery for their patients for their presbyopia. So uh, stay tuned for that, or maybe discuss that with your eye doctor about what's best for you. And getting back to Michelle, what, was, what did I recommend for her for her presbyopia? Well, first of all, we talked about what her needs were. And basically she didn't wanna wear glasses and keep taking them on and off, you know, putting them on and off during the day. So I recommended to her um, modified monovision contact lenses. And this is a little bit more of an advanced treatment option for presbyopia, but this worked very, very well for her. Basically she was using one eye for distance and the other eye for both distance and reading, which gave her very, very crystal clear vision. Um, and then I gave her the prescription eye drop viewity as needed. Um, for certain conditions, you know, for certain tasks. And I taught her all of my top hacks for devices. 
And then finally, you know, she said, you know, I don't see myself wearing these contacts indefinitely. So I would like to explore some surgical options. So um, that's something I think I told her, let's hold off until you're in your forties. And at that point, if you really still feel like you can't function with what I've given you so far, maybe we can consider a surgical option for you for your presbyopia. So with that, um, any questions that you have about presbyopia? Maybe I can take like one or two questions. And again, I'm trying my best to stay on time, but there's a lot of information I wanna share with you. I hope you're finding this useful so far. So just put it into the chat um, if you have any questions right now. Okay, so now moving on. Um, next, we're gonna be talking about eye strain and light sensitivity. Now, oh, sorry, we're going the wrong way, one second. So um, for this section, I'm gonna actually start with my patient's story because I think this is really, really important um, because his story is very similar to many people's stories. His story will probably resonate with you. Um, so Richard is 42 years old, he's very healthy. Um, he spends for work at least 10 to 12 hours a day on a screen. And then plus for personal use, he probably spends another two or three hours more than that. Um, you know, whether it's uh, answering emails or scrolling on social media or watching television, Netflix, um, he's on screens for most of the day. And he developed during the pandemic, he developed very, very severe blurred vision from being on a screen. And he was extremely light sensitive. Anytime he opened up a screen, he really had a lot of discomfort. And it got to the point where he just could not spend uh, the amount of time on a screen that he needed to spend for his work. So he was really incapacitated by this issue of light sensitivity and blurred vision from being on screens. And he'd actually been to many eye doctors before he came to see me. I think I was maybe his fifth eye doctor that he saw because um, the strategies that other doctors had given him didn't, they just weren't helping him so far. So, um, so let's just talk a little bit about um, screen time, because I know we are all so dependent on our screens. Um, there was an interesting study that was published in the Scientific American. Um, this is actually not a study. It was a survey that was done of readers of Scientific American, just to get a sense of how many hours people spent on a screen. So just put into the chat, how many hours do you think the average adult spends on a screen every day? Is it four hours, six hours, eight hours? more put into the chat what do you think okay 10 12 any other guesses eight plus 11 total screen time yes total screen time okay so i'm getting uh mainly eight plus uh, in my previous webinar some people said two or three so um the actual answer here is uh, based on the survey that scientific american did most adults spend about 10 hours, 39 minutes in front of a screen every day. That is mind boggling to me that we spend, the average adult spends this much time on a screen. And keep in mind, this survey was done pre pandemic. So you can imagine now that number must have skyrocketed. Um, many people are still working from home or connecting through screens. So our, that number is sky high and, um, you know, you have to think about what the health implications are of all of this screen time, especially for our eyes, because many people from all of that screen time uh, develop this condition called digital eye strain. Now, this is kind of an umbrella term that we use. Um, an, an alternative term or a synonymous term is computer eye strain or um, computer vision syndrome is also sometimes what it's called. But basically, this is a constellation of symptoms that can happen, uh, including dry, itchy eyes, watery eyes, tired, a tired feeling, headaches, blurred vision, and sometimes even neck, back, or shoulder pain from being on screens all day long. And basically, you know, when I was talking to Richard, my patient, I was asking about all of these questions. And basically, he said yes to each of these symptoms. So he was having very severe um, digital eye strain. And, um, and uh, when you think about the root cause of this type of eye strain or digital eye strain, what is the root cause? Well, there's three components to it, two of which I already explained to you during today's webinar. One is dry eye. So dry eye is a major component of eye strain and it can cause a lot of those symptoms, dryness, blurry vision, watering, 
um, irritation, and then an incorrect prescription, especially for up close, whether it's intermediate or reading distance, um, will really also or can contribute to eye strain as well. So it's really important to address those two things, dry eye and incorrect prescription. And then the third component of eye strain is light sensitivity. So now let's talk a little bit more about light sensitivity. Um, so why do people have light sens sensitivity from computer screens? It's because our screens emit along with all the other colors they emit, they emit a, a, a large amount of blue light. And there's been a lot of talk, I know, controversial uh, kind of thoughts about blue light. Is it beneficial for us? Is it harmful for us? What's the, what's the bottom line about blue light exposure? So let me just break that down for you. And then I'll explain about what are some tips I have for dealing with light sensitivity. So blue light, um, if you think about the range of light, um, out there in the world. There's light that we can see, which is within the, the, um, the visible spectrum, which are basically all the colors of the rainbow. And that um, is usually between about 400 to about 680 nanometers. Then there's light that we don't see. So there's shorter wavelengths of light, which are UV light rays. And then there are longer wavelengths of light, infrared light, light rays. So a visible light is kind of right in the middle. And if you look at blue, blue is on the shorter end of that visible light spectrum. So the uh, blue light is usually about 400 to about 480, 490 nanometers. That's the range of blue light. And because it's on the shorter end of the spectrum, um, it is very high energy short wavelength light that potentially can cause issues, health issues and eye issues as well. So let's go through what that could be. So um, let, I'll just explain this diagram as well. So uh, in terms of light rays, the UV light, most UV light, whether it's UV C, UV B, UV A comes from the sun. And a lot of that UV light is, is uh, you know, beneficially it's um, basically filtered out by our atmosphere, ozone layer. Some of that light does get in to the eye and um, the eye has uh, ways to also filter it out so it doesn't cause any harm. It's filtered out partially by the cornea, the lens, and some of that UV light does get into the retina, into the back of the eye that could potentially cause damage. That's UV light. Now, what about visible light and specifically blue light? Basically, all of this light gets through. All of it gets through, through the ozone layer, through the cornea, through the lens and hits the back of the eye. Now, remember I said that blue light is high energy light that could potentially do harm. So um, let's, let me explain a little bit about that. Now, there is no evidence, there's no scientific evidence that this blue light will cause permanent damage. And I want everyone to be very, very clear about that. There is no permanent damage done by all of this blue light. However, it can cause other adverse health effects. It can affect our sleep, meaning it can affect our circadian rhythm, it can contribute to eye strain, and it can tr trigger light sensitivity. Now, most of the blue light, we actually get lots of blue light all day long. Most of the blue light that we're exposed to actually comes from the sun. And that's healthy blue light. It's beneficial blue light because it helps to regulate our not only our sleep cycle, but also helps to regulate our mood and our alertness level. So we need that blue light that comes from the sun. Now the blue light that comes from the sun actually varies during the course of the day. So earlier in the day, that blue light is strongest and that's a signal to our bodies, okay, it's time to wake up, it's time to you know, get started with the day. But as the day progresses, the amount of blue light from the sun starts to go down. And when it goes down, it's a signal to our bodies that it's time to uh, wrap up the day, it's time to get ready for bed. Um, and go to sleep. However, there are many artificial sources of blue light that throw off that normal circadian rhythm that the sun should be setting. So basically, all of the artificial blue light that we are exposed to comes from our devices or it comes from bulbs. Uh, our devices, whether it be your phone, your tablet, your computer, any monitor basically, even a television set emits blue light. Um, also, the bulbs that we currently use in our homes, many of the bulbs we use are um, energy saving bulbs, whether they're LED bulbs or CFL bulbs, all of these bulbs emit blue light. So we are constantly getting bombarded by blue light, even after the normal blue light from the sun, the natural blue light that we're supposed to get has, has gone, you know, it's gone, the sun is set, we still continue to get exposed to all of this blue light. And that's where the health effects come from. So I don't know if any of you have, have experienced this, but I know for sure that when I'm on my computer late into the night, 
um, it's really hard to fall asleep because that blue light is just a stimulus for our brains to stay awake, our bodies to stay awake. So think about that when you're using your screen, especially all day long past sunset, um, what that blue light may be potentially uh, interfering with in your life. Now, um, what about uh, uh, ways to block that blue light, that artificial blue light? Should you be getting blue blocking glasses? Well, there was an interesting study done published in Consumer Reports back in 2016. And this um, study looked at the top three, uh, top uh, selling blue blockers on the market. And as you can see here that they're all different tints. One is kind of a, a brighter orange yellowish tint. One is a very light yellow tint and the other one looks almost clear. And what Consumer Reports did was they evaluated um, these blue blockers to see how much blue light that they actually block. And what they found was that there was only one of the glasses, the more deeply tinted yellow glasses that blocked almost 99, 98 to 99% of the blue light. The other ones, the mildly yellow tinted glasses blocked about 50% of the blue light. And the ones that were practically clear only blocked about 30% of the blue light. So the bottom line here, the take home message is that blue blockers can help to uh, modulate the effects of blue light on your sleep, uh, but it's really important to consider the tint of your blue blocker. And for example, I'll show you what I use. Um, so I use uh, blue blockers. I have two different kinds of blue blockers. Oh, this is upside down. This is upside down too. Anyway, I have a deeper tint, which is a red tint, and I have a yellowish tint. I don't know if you can see that right there. It's a light yellow tint. So at nighttime, when I'm working late into the night, I use these blue blockers. And when I put them on, I know it looks, they're not the most cosmetic, but when I put them on, basically, if I look at blue on my screen, I don't see any blue whatsoever on my screen. So I know that these blue blockers are blocking almost 100% of the blue light that's coming from my screen. Um, then during the day, if I'm if my eyes are a little bit sensitive and if I'm feeling some eye strain, sometimes I use these lighter tinted blue blockers and I can still see blue, but definitely my vision is much, um, it's, uh, it's not as strained. I, I feel like a soothing effect from using these blue blockers. So think about if you're going to choose a blue blocker, think about the tint of the blue blocker that you're planning to get. Now, um, do they really work? That's the other question. Well, it's controversial. Um, there are, I'll go back one second. Um, there are studies out there to show that blue blocking glasses really did no, you know, they really had no benefit for people who are on computer screens, but those studies were a little bit flawed because the, the people that they studied were only on screens for two hours. And uh, the majority of us spend way more than two hours on a screen. And they were using a, a lightly tinted blue blocker that blocked about 30% of the blue light. So we don't really know if you're using a deeper tint blue blocker, uh, if that will have more benefit. So I think that study needs to be done at some point in the future is to do a another study using a deeper tint blue blocker to see if patients' sim symptoms of uh, light sensitivity and eye strain improve. If you are choosing, choosing a blue blocker, I would suggest getting something that's a deeper tint, either a red, uh, deep red, or deep yellow, amber, orange. These are the types of tints that will block most of the blue light. If you're um, you know, at your eye doctor's office and you're trying on different blue you know, glasses and they're uh, offering you a blue blocker, ask what percentage blue light does that blue blocker really block? Because if you're getting something that's only 20%, it's probably not gonna do you much good. So you might as well invest in a deeper tint blue blocker than a lighter tint blue blocker. Um, and then, so that was my insight tip number five. My last insight tip, we're almost coming to the end here. Insight tip number six is to use a screen filtering app, a software that is that you can download to your computer or your device that will internally take out the blue light after the sun sets. Now, this software is very sophisticated. It knows where you are geographically. It knows when the sun is setting and slowly it starts to reduce the amount of blue light later on in the day. So it's all it's adjusting the amount of blue light based on where you are and uh, sunrise and sunset. So this app that I love is called, oh, by the way, I'm gonna have my staff put into the chat the links for those blue blockers that I know a lot of people have asked me like which are the, what's the brand of blue blocker that you use? So this is called True Dark. This is the brand that I trust. Um, uh, that I, I that works very well for me and for many of my patients. And I'm also going to have my staff put into the chat the link for this app because it's really phenomenal. It's again 
very sophisticated. There are 27 different settings you can use on this app. And based on what your needs are, if you just need you know, a little bit of help, you can use the healthy setting. If you're you know, working late into the night, you can use a, um, uh, a night setting or a gaming setting or a movie setting, a sleep setting. So there's lots of different settings you can play around with. You can download it to any device except a t television. So it's not possible to download it to a television. Um, and I think this app, um, I think they have a free trial of between seven to 14 days. And then if you wanted to purchase it, it's a nominal, nominal amount and you have it for life. So I would strongly recommend uh, trying out the app, playing around with it and maybe uh, purchasing it because it's really very, very helpful uh, to, to deal with blue light. So um, any questions about eye strain or light sensitivity? Okay, so um, there is one question. Uh, do you not want to wear a blue blocker earlier in the day so it doesn't interfere with circadian rhythm? What I would say is definitely in the morning, um, don't wear a blue blocker. Uh, but maybe once it's mid-afternoon, if you're feeling eye strain, you may want to put on a blue blocker, uh, maybe a lighter tint blue blocker rather than a really deep tint blue blocker. But during the morning hours, I would suggest, you know, if you want to stay on a regular circadian rhythm and keep as much with the sun as possible, is to not wear it uh, very early, or early on in the day and just leave it for later on in the day. Um, does blue light filtering glasses help? Well, that's what basically I had mentioned. I had talked about earlier, there are different types of blue blockers and that's why um, you really have to kind of experiment and see what you're most comfortable with. If you're able to maybe go to an optical shop and just try on different blue blockers, see what tints they have and see what is best for you. Uh, so I'm gonna just move on. And then if there are more questions, I, I'm happy to answer them at the end, but I do wanna keep going because I, I wanna be very uh, respectful of your time. Uh, so basically, we've covered in the past hour or so that we've spent together, uh, we've covered three main eye topics and how you can manage them. Simple DIY strategies to manage dry eye uh, based off of what the root cause may be. Um, so, and I gave you two insight tips for managing dry eye. Um, I recommended using artificial tears very frequently. And I gave you some tips on which drops you can try and what to stay away from. And then uh, the second insight tip for dry eye management was doing hot compresses and how to do them properly. Next, we talked about presbyopia, which is difficulty reading or loss of accommodation. And I gave you two tips for that. Um, if you uh, currently don't wear a prescription, you could just get simple over-the-counter reading glasses and try on different ones based on your age and find what works best for you. Or you can consider um, uh, uh, just doing some device hacks and lighting hacks. And of course, then there are more advanced strategies like prescription drops, et cetera. Um, and different types of glasses as well, which I didn't get a chance to talk about, but different types of contact lenses, glasses, and then finally surgery would be a last option. And then finally, we talked about eye strain and light sensitivity. Um, my two insight tips there were to use a deeper tint blue blocker if you wanna use blue blockers later in the day. And then second, secondly, to, um, to use the Iris app, which is very, very useful. Um, so, um, now, again, we're just over the one hour point. I want to thank everybody who stayed with me, but we are not done yet. Um, so again, I covered a lot. Just put into the chat if you've had value, if you learned something new, uh, maybe what you learned that was new that you didn't know before from today's uh, talk, and maybe you know one actionable thing that you're going to change in terms of your eyes. Um, I would love to hear what some people have learned um, in the past hour or so. So just share that into the chat. Um, on previous webinars, uh, people said that they learned about um, why it's important to use hot compresses to help your meibomian glands function well. Um, and uh, on previous webinars, people have said uh, that the iris screen filtering app was something new that they'd never heard about before. So that was really helpful. Um, anything else people have have learned that they want to share or something that they're going to implement in their um, in their lives to protect their eyes? Okay. Okay, great. So um, Joanne has put, um, uh, she's going to use, or she's going to think about using drops um, more frequently for dry eyes. And then um, Terry has said that she's going to check out the blue blocking app. Um, so, uh, so with that, I would like to, um, you know, I've, I've shared a lot of information with you. I've given you a lot of tips. Um, but, you know, when it comes to eye health, um, yes, it's important to 
first understand what the problem is, to get the correct diagnosis, to understand what the root cause is, where it's coming from, uh, not just to put a bandaid on the problem. Next is to implement the first line strategies that I taught you. Uh, these strategies are DIY, uh, they're um, non-invasive, the majority of them are inexpensive, but then some people do need to go on to higher level strategies that they need to discuss with their eye doctor. It's important to understand what your options are for all of these issues um, before um, making a decision, making an informed decision about what some of those higher level strategies um, are appropriate. Uh, whether they're appropriate for you or not. And then uh, the final thing, which, um, you know, I am again, an integrative eye doctor. I did not get a chance to talk about all of the great nutritional and lifestyle strategies that, um, that are also important, but that is something to consider as well. So I've given you the foundation, but um, you know, when I was creating this webinar, I thought, okay, there's only so much I can teach in about an hour, um, but maybe, you know, there, um, there are some other options that people want to explore. So I had two choices. We either to stop, we could stop the webinar right now, or we could continue going and I could continue sharing with you some other uh, ways in which we can maybe work together uh, so that you can get um, higher levels of understanding about how to deal with some of these aging issues and use some of those additional higher level, higher tier strategies, tier two and tier three, in terms of, um, of uh, taking care of your eyes and then layer on the nutritional lifestyle aspects on top of that. So, um, so basically in order to take you to the next level, to help you get to the next level, um, I'm really um, uh, uh, pleased to uh, share with you a new program that I'm, I'm introducing in 2023 called Ageless Eyes by Dr. Rani. Now this is a program that I've been thinking about um, uh, starting for a while, but I decided to finally launch it this year. This is an online course um, that I'm launching. And this course will help people who've had issues as they've gotten older, um, uh, vision issues such as difficulty reading in low light, dry, scratchy, irritated eyes that are not being helped by using the, the baseline strategies like artificial tears or warm compresses. People who are very extremely sensitive to light. I have some patients who can't even go outside because they're so, so light sensitive. Um, a lot of my patients uh, wish that they, um, they knew how to kind of turn back the clock and turn back their years and restore their visual function again. So this is really why I decided to create this online course is to try to reach as many people as possible to help with them with some of these aging eye issues. Because the truth is that um, you know you may uh, have an eye doctor that you work with, but most people when they go see their eye doctor, they only get about 10 to 15 minutes of face-to-face -face time with their eye doctor. Uh, they may get other tests done when they're in the office. There's probably a lot of other testing that's done, but actual face-to-face -face time, asking the questions, getting the information that they need is limited simply because of the way our healthcare system is designed. So this course is designed to fill in those gaps, to provide you with all the additional material and tips and strategies that I use myself and I use in my practice with my patients to get them to where they need to be with their eye health. So, um, so my goal with this course is to teach people, um, give them the roadmap that they need to manage their biggest vision challenges as they get older to maintain healthy eyesight despite the passage of time. And that's why I call this ageless eyes. This is not anti-aging. I'm not trying to stop aging because some things we can't necessarily stop. For example, presbyopia, it happens. It's part of natural aging. We can't necessarily stop it, but we can manage it and we can still um, enjoy a healthy vision despite having some of these eye issues. So that's really my goal is to teach you how to uh, navigate some of these aging changes with grace and age gracefully without losing visual function. Um, so, uh, so my goal is with this course is to help people, um, you know, just do the things that they normally would do in their daily lives and be comfortable in, and have clear vision doing it. For example, uh, picking up a menu in a dimly lit restaurant and still being able to read comfortably or looking in the mirror and seeing youthful bright eyes. So um, in, during the time of the course, um, within a few weeks, my goal is to teach you key strategies um, that you need to help turn back the years and enjoy youthful, healthy vision for years and decades going forward. So what is this course? What is it, what is it comprised of? Well, there are three core modules in the course um, over three weeks. Week one is the dry eye solution uh, beyond over-the-counter drops. Week two is the presbyopia solution beyond reading glasses. Week three is the light solution beyond blue blockers. And um, 
And just to give you a little bit more um, uh, uh, information about each of the modules in week one, um, I will teach you how to manage your dry eye issue by addressing the root cause. So you don't have to suffer from dry eye symptoms like discomfort, redness, scratchiness, ear irritation, blurry vision. And we'll go through what all those three levels, those three tiers of treatment are, whether it's the first level, the second level, which is um, uh, includes uh, prescription drops like Restasis or Zydra. You may have seen ads on television for some of those drops. They all have pluses and minuses. So we go through in the course what the pluses and minuses are, and then more advanced strategies for treating myoblumin gland dysfunction, whether it's Lipiflow or other technologies like Blef, Blef, um, Blefx or um, uh, there's also something called IPL, intense pulse laser, whether that's right for you or not. And then there are some higher level strategies. For example, what I used in some of my patients, compounded eye drops, um, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, drops, uh, diet is key as well. And, um, and then finally, there are procedures that can be done for dry eye, procedures like punctal plugs or surgeries even for dry eye that can be done. So that's what I cover in module one the dry eye solution in module two is a presbyopia solution. So here I discuss beyond reading glasses, what all the options are to help you read clearly and comfortably both for um, uh, up close as well as for the computer. Uh, so in this module, I cover uh, progressives, um, all kinds of uh, variants of that, whether it's bifocals, trifocals, which most people don't wear these days, most people choose progressives, but also um, uh, contact lenses, multifocal contact lenses, monovision, modified monovision, which is what I use for Michelle, and then the surgical options, as well as the eye drop options. Uh, now, keep in mind that drops are not for everyone. There are pluses and minuses. There are risks and benefits to using drops like Beauty. And it's really important before you go and get a prescription that you understand what those risks and benefits are before just making that uh, decision uh, about using um, a prescription eye drop. So, um, so that's covered in module two. And then in module three is the light solution. Um, to discover not just ways to modulate um, potentially harmful light, including UV light, which we didn't get a chance to talk about, you know, what are the best types of sunglasses? How can you choose the best types of sunglasses? Uh, to modulate blue light on a, on a higher level than what I described today, using just blue blockers, using nutrition to help modulate blue light, um, as well as uh, supplements, because a lot of people ask me about blue light supplements. Uh, should I be using the supplement or not? So I break it down in terms of what are the nutrients? How, are, how do they work? And how can you choose a supplement that's right for you? And then um, the other part of this module is something that many eye doctors probably are not even aware of that I talk about, which is using therapeutic wavelengths of light. Now this includes red light and infrared light, which can be therapeutic in many different ways. This is really um, emerging research. So this is really uh, state-of-the-art technology that I use in my practice with some of my patients to use these various different wavelengths of light. It's not color therapy. It's not syntonics, if you've heard of those two things before, but it's using photobiomodulation. That's what it's called, photobiomodulation for beneficial aspects of, um, of light uh, for your eyes. And then, um, so basically, uh, this is the layout for the course. Um, uh, all, the, all the sessions, there'll be two sessions per week. There will be a Zoom session, which will be the training, similar to what I'm doing today. So about a 90-minute training uh, in which I'll explain to you, you know, what are all the options. I'll give you the different tiers of options. So you have all, all the information, all the knowledge. And then um, that'll be held on a Monday and then on Friday, we'll do a live Q&A where I will go through all of your questions, get all of your questions answered. Um, and then um, that will also be via Zoom. Now, both of these live sessions will be at 12 p.m. Eastern, um, again, Monday and then Friday. Now, if you're, um, let's say you're at work and 12 o'clock doesn't work well for you, um, fortunately, all of the sessions are recorded, so you will have lifetime access to those sessions. And if you have questions you want to ask, you can always send them in ahead of time so I can answer that question. And then you can watch the recording. And always re you can always reach out to me through my office. And if you have a specific question, I can answer it kind of off offline as well. Um, if you can't make the session or if you're in a different time zone and 12 o'clock Eastern doesn't really work for you, we can work around that. Um, in addition to the, the modules for the course, uh, the, the sessions, you'll also get exclusive resources. 
These include um, my resources, my curated eye health products, because there's so many eye health products out there on the market. Um, and you know what's good, what's what's trustworthy, what's not trustworthy. What are some of the products that I use for myself and in my practice? So I share all of that with you. I, I provide checklists, I provide self-assessments, and I provide recipes as well as part of the resources for the course. And then finally, you um, have an invitation to join me in my ageless community. This is a Facebook community um, in which um, I invite everyone to share their experiences and their knowledge and the products that they use so we can all learn. So this is not just you know my teaching you, this is a community aspect of things uh, to share what works, what doesn't work, um, the pluses and minuses of various different um, strategies and products, et cetera. So uh, if you're not on Facebook, um, unfortunately, then you won't be able to join the Facebook community, but I found that Facebook is a great way. It's a private Facebook group. It's not a public group. It's a private group. So it's a great way to, um, to develop you know, a sense of, Okay, I'm not alone in this problem. I know that other people out there also have this problem. So how can I um, how can I um, join this community? And this is uh, you get access this way. Um, now, uh, what is the value of the course? How much does it cost? Because uh, that's um, something that you really should think about. Um, if you think about what is the value of your vision, um, I've had patients who, unfortunately, they've had other eye issues uh, in which are not reversible, which are irreversible that have caused them uh, their eye, eye health. Um, for example, patients with eye strokes, with retina problems, macular degeneration, um, all of these things can potentially be prevented. And in those cases, you know, patients have already lost vision. They come to me saying, what can I do? Can, I, can you help me reverse this? And when something like that has happened, if there's already a vision loss to a certain extent, that vision loss unfortunately can be irreversible. So I explained to them that, you know, um, you know, it's unfortunate that it happened, but there are other things you can do to keep your eyes healthy. There are still ways to be proactive. So um, you can institute some of these changes now, but they tell me, I wish I had known this earlier. I wish I had known that I could do all of these different things to help save my vision before this horrible thing happened to my vision and I lost my vision permanently. So if you think about value, um, those patients who've lost their vision will pay anything to try to get their vision back. They will do anything. Um, so in that situation, if you think about it, vision is priceless. We use it for everything we do um, from you know all of our daily tasks, basically. And I, in my opinion, vision is the most precious of all of our five senses. And we, again, we should do whatever is possible to protect and preserve it. It's priceless. The value of this program, when I do it in my office, if I do it live face-to-face -face in my office with the patient, uh, basically an initial consultation and intake plus four follow-up sessions, uh, the, the value of that is about $2,000. However, this is an online course. This is not face-to-face. -face. Um, in this course, I'm not your doctor. I'm um, more of your coach, your vision coach. So, um, so the cost of this as an online program is $7.99. However, because you're on this webinar with me, I'm offering a special price of $3.99. So it's 50% off through this webinar. Um, and also for the first course cohort, I'm actually going to be offering two bonus sessions. So it's $3.99 and you get these extra bonuses in addition to those three modules that I explained. One is the youthful session and one is the eye makeup masterclass. Now, let me explain what these are. So in the youthful solution beyond cosmetic surgery, I basically share with you my best practices on how you can keep your eyes looking youthful, no matter what age you are, um, how to prevent fine lines and creases, how to manage dark circles under the eyes, how to manage eye bags or, or sagging eyelids. So these are all covered in the course. And I try to steer people more towards um, natural strategies rather than cosmetic surgery. And using some of these strategies, um, hopefully, uh, in, in my practice, I've helped patients avoid cosmetic surgery, but hopefully you'll learn strategies to help avoid having to have an eyelid you know, surgery done or, or um, a blepharoplasty, for example, or a facelift. And, um, and you know, that I think this module alone is worth the co cost of the course because uh, most cosmetic surgeries run you several thousand um, dollars. And so, you know, the cost of the course is $3.99 and you get this as a bonus, so it pretty much pays for itself if you're considering getting some kind of cosmetic surgery done to help you reverse the years in terms of your cosmetic appearance. 
That's one module, the bonus. The other bonus, this I'm really, really excited about this bonus because this is the first time um, I'm gonna be working with one of my colleagues. Uh, she's also an ophthalmologist. She's a board certified ophthalmologist. She's also founder of an eye makeup company called 2020. And um, basically, uh, her name is Dr. Diane Hillel Campo, and we're going to be doing a, a joint session. We're going to be teaching a joint session on best eye makeup tips. Now, this may be applicable mainly to women. I guess maybe some men may be interested in this as well. Uh, but uh, eye makeup tips, because we've seen collectively, Dr. Campo and I have seen so many people who've developed eye issues from their eye makeup. Um, unhealthy eye makeup brands and unhealthy practices that can cause issues, allergic reactions, scarring, uh, loss of lashes, um, styes, all of these eye makeup issues can be prevented if you use safe eye makeup techniques and safe um, ingredients in your eye makeup. So we're going to be covering a lot of that in this um, special session. So basically, just to kind of give you an overview of how the course is laid out, there's four weeks, the, um, the three core modules plus the bonus week, the bonus module. And then um, in terms of dates, this course is going to start January 16th. So it's about a week and a half from now we're going to be starting. So the initial training will be on a Monday, uh, January 16th at 12 o'clock noon. And then the Q&A will be Friday, January 20th. And so uh, basically every week we'll do uh, er, um, one module every single week. Um, now, uh, again, there's the, the core modules plus the bonuses. And um, because, and this price, the regular price for this for the first cohort would be $3.99, but because you've stayed on the webinar with me, we've gone well over an hour, we're almost at an hour and 20 minutes now, um, I am actually offering even a, a better deal for you. So it's not gonna be $3.99, it's gonna be $2.99. And that is basically a savings of 63% off of the regular price of $7.99. So you can get this price, $2.99, if you register by the time we end the webinar today. So, um, so basically, um, you will get that $2.99 price. And I'm going to show you how you can get that. I'm going to ask my staff to put into the chat the link to register for the course Ageless Eyes by Dr. Rani. In addition to this fast action price of $2.99, you'll also be joining my Aegis community as founding members, which means that you will get special discounts off of products, um, whether it be um, uh, eye care products, whether it be um, uh, supplements, books, courses, you will get special discounts off of future products that you, uh, you invest in for your eyes. And um, sorry, again, if I could have my staff put into... Uh, the chat, the link for the course. Um, and there we go. Great. So now it's there. And also the other benefit of doing the fast action is that if you register now in the first cohort, um, you will get the course that's live, meaning it's going to be a live training with a live Q&A. If you register for the course later, let's say you say, okay, I can't really take it right now, or I'm not interested right now. Maybe I'll take it in a couple of months, or maybe I'll take it next year. You will not get access to the live course. You're going to get a pre-recorded course. So this is the only time you'll get the live course at this price. And then finally, um, I'm also developing an app which I'm gonna be calling the Ageless app. And on this app, there's gonna be great um, nutrition and lifestyle tips to promote eye health. And so I'm, uh, I'm creating this app and you're gonna get free access to the beta version of the app uh, coming out probably in the spring of 2023. So, um, so if you register now for 2.99, just click that link and it will take you to the registration page. Let me walk you through what the registration page looks like. One second here. Okay, um, uh, to get this special discount, you wanna put in the discount code ageless. And so when you first click on the link, this is what you're gonna see. You're gonna see my Vision Academy, which is where I host all of my courses. I also have other courses on um, macular degeneration, on thyroid eye disease, on visual snow syndrome. But this course is there as well, Age of Size by Dr. Rani. And you can find out more about the course, course. You can scroll down and you can see a lot more details about the course and FAQs. But basically, you hit the Register Now button, and that will take you to this checkout page. And yes, you have to put in your information so you can create a, an account. But here under coupon code, you see the regular price is $3.99. If you put in the coupon code AGELESS, you will see that you will get $100 off 
Uh, so the price for you will be $2.99. And then you can go ahead and you can put in your credit card number, or if you choose to pay via PayPal, you can do it that way as well. So this is what the registration looks like and how you put in the coupon code here, ageless. Um, now, uh, for this course, for this coming cohort in January, I have limited spots. It's, there are only 100 spots available. And um, I've already had many, many people sign up for the course. So um, I have limited spots left. Um, I've already had hundreds of, page, of people um, read, take the webinar because I did it on Monday and Wednesday. And today is the third day that I'm doing it. So, uh, so probably the course will sell out. So try to uh, act fast, get this, um, uh, this registration done as soon as possible. So not only can you get the special price, you can still get a seat because otherwise the seats may not um, may not still be there. And also, um, in case you're a little bit you know concerned, let's say you say, well, I don't really know if I need this course or not. Uh, my symptoms aren't that bad. Um, I offer a money back guarantee. So I'm very confident that you're going to love this course and you're going to get a lot of useful information out of it. Um, hopefully you've gotten useful in, from in, information out of today's webinar, which is Again, sorry, it's been well over uh, well over an hour now that we've been going. So thank you for staying with me. Um, but um, I'm so confident that you're going to get value out of this, that after the first module, after that first training session together, if you're not satisfied, if you think, oh, this course is not for me, you all you need to do is email my staff um, at info at rudranibanikmd.com and just say, I'm not satisfied with, with Ageless Eyes by Dr. Rani, and we will issue a full refund within seven to 10 business days, no questions asked. A full refund if you take the first module and if you're not satisfied. My goal is to provide you with value to help you keep your eyes healthy and strong. And if I don't provide that value, then I should not be charging you. So I will gladly refund you the money if you think that this course is not valuable. But again, I think that you're going to learn so many unique things that maybe your eye doctor simply doesn't have the time to, to teach you or may not even know about, like the light solution that I was explaining to you about before, the nutrition aspect of things, the lifestyle aspect of things when it comes to eye health. I think you will love the course. So I'm pretty confident that you will probably not be um, asking for a refund after the first module. So now I'm going to basically open it up to some questions and I'm going to just uh, stay on for another 10 minutes for whomever has questions that they want to ask. Um, here's the link again, if you wanted to sign up and I'm uh, happy to take any questions that people put into the chat. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, so there's a question, how long will it take someone to get through a module? So basically, um, the training is about 90 minutes on a Monday, and then the Q&A is um, another 60 minutes. And then there'll be worksheets and guides and things like that um, that will be uh, available to you. So um, basically, each module is one week long. But if you can't do it during that week, um, you get access to the recordings, you will get lifetime access to all of the recordings in the course. So don't worry about that. If you can't make a module, if you have to miss one, if you say you're traveling, or something comes up, you can still access that indefinitely. So, um, so don't worry about the timing of the course. Okay. Um, Another question, do we need to worry about screen brightness in addition to the filter software? So the, the filter software is able to actually internally adjust the brightness depending on what setting you have it on. It's very sophisticated. So once you try it out, you'll see that you can um, your screen will look a little bit different because it's already filtering out certain wavelengths of light and adjusting the screen brightness. I think you can override it. Let's say you know it's a little bit too dark. I think you can probably override it. Um, but um, but it is doing what um, it is um, programmed to do, again, based off of when the sun rises and the, when the sun sets in your geographic time zone. Um, so, okay, let's see. Um, any other questions here? Okay, iPad and iPhone at the same time, double count it. Um, yes, <laughs> that's a lot of uh, light getting into your eyes. And then of course you add on top of that, uh, if you're you know, in, a, in, a, in a room in the evening and the, the CFL bulbs are on or the LEDs are on, that's extra blue light you're getting, plus the TV's on. So that is a lot of blue light. And again, it can really interfere with sleep. It can cause um, eye strain. So 
that's why I think in some cases, yes, you can use the Iris app for your devices, but it's sometimes it's best to actually put the app on, but also maybe wear a blue blocker on top of that. And you will see your eyes will immediately relax. Like when you, when I put on my blue blockers, it is really amazing. I notice the difference right away. Um, my eyes just feel much more at, at peace and not like I'm straining all the time to see well. So it's really, really very helpful. Um, okay. Okay, so I had a question earlier about nutrition. And so in the course, every single module, I will be sharing with you nutrition tips, uh, depending on what the module is. So for example, for the dry eye module, I will share with you nutrition tips about um, uh, that will help your dry eye as well as help your meibomian glands. And then, um, and as part of that, I'll also talk about what supplements are out there and how you can make an informed decision about the supplement that you're choosing. Let's say you're taking something for your dry eye. So that gets incorporated into each module. And in the second module about uh, uh, a presbyopia, um, I talk about how you can keep your eye lens, the lens inside your eye healthy. And so that will help not only uh, just help you, your lens to stay supple and flexible, but also will help prevent cataracts. So that gets incorporated into module two. And in module three, um, this is something that many people don't know about. Maybe if you've been you know, following me on social media, or if, you, um, if you've been a patient of mine, I do talk about this. There are nutrients that are blue blockers that we can we can eat these you know, foods that have these nutrients that will help protect us from blue light and UV light. So we can get um, a, a boost our natural blue blocking ability by eating these nutrients. And all of that is covered in the course, depending on again, which module you're, you're in, you will get specific nutrition tips, supplement tips and lifestyle tips. And then finally, for the last module, that bonus module, which is on, on youthfulness and beauty, there are certain um, tips that I recommend for, uh, to keep your skin looking healthy. Um, there are definitely um, uh, foods, uh, spices, um, specific ingredients that can help you uh, stay youthful. So all of that is included in the course. And plus I also share with you um, recipes, some of my favorite recipes. So that does bring me to um, one of my, so for those of you who are still here with me right now, uh, I wanna thank you because you are all going to get um, access to some special gifts that are going to be coming up very soon. So I'm just going to see here if there's any other questions. Okay, so there's a question about um, broken blood vessels um, on the surface of the eye and the dye that we use. Um, doesn't the, don't those chemicals get inside the blood vessel in the eyes? So uh, so no, actually, um, we have a covering on the surface of the eye, almost like the skin of the eye, and so um, that dye does not get into your eye itself. Um, it stays on the surface. So uh, so the covering of the eye, it's called the conjunctiva prevents any of that dye from getting absorbed. So basically um, it's on the surface and then eventually you blink it out. So usually within about uh, 15 minutes or so that dye is, is out, it's kind of flushed out by your tears and it doesn't get inside the eye. Now, the other types of eye drops that we use, we use um, dilating drops during the eye exam to dilate your eyes. Those drops do get absorbed into the eye. Uh, however, those drops are relatively short acting. Depending on which drop your doctor has used, some drops last about two to three hours and they keep your eyes dilated for two to three hours. Other drops can last longer, four to six hours. And then there are some drops that we use uh, as prescription drops for certain eye issues that will dilate the eyes for anywhere from 12 hours to two weeks. So there's different levels of dilation and different duration of all of the drops. But I do strongly recommend that people get a dilated exam um, at least once a year or every two years, especially if you're an adult over the age of 40, you should be having a dilated eye exam every one to two years. So don't worry about the, the drops because they're short acting. They don't last. Um, they do temporarily cause some blurry vision, especially for reading. If you have a dilated eye, it's really, really hard to read, but then eventually it wears off within a few hours and then your vision goes back to normal. So, um, okay. Okay, there's one more question. When I use um, a lubricating drop, do I need to close my eyes while instilling? 
Uh, so there are different techniques to instill a drop. I usually recommend um, uh, putting it in, uh, looking, visualizing when it goes in. So I actually have people look into a mirror and then put the drop into that pocket. You can lie down and kind of put the drop into the corner of your eye and then open your eye and then it will go in. That's another way to do it. Um, yes, if you keep your eyes closed, there's more of a chance that, that drop will get absorbed by your eye rather than ending up going down your cheek. So yes, that is a technique that you can use if you're using artificial tears and they end up more, most of it ends up more on your face than in your eye. Definitely you can close your eyes when you're putting the drops in. Will there be eye exercises in the course? Yes, yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so this is something that I definitely um, do discuss with my patients and I'm gonna be sharing in the course. Uh, certain types of eye exercises. Eye exercises to help with dry eye, eye exercises to help with eye strain. Um, unfortunately, there is no eye exercise that will cure presbyopia. A lot of people ask me like, is there something I can do to reverse my presbyopia? And I say, no, unfortunately there isn't because um, that doesn't necessarily have to do with the muscle that has to do with the lens itself. But for the other two conditions, I do share eye exercises. Um, that are really good to do on a daily basis, I think, um, to help maintain healthy vision. So yes. Okay, can dry eye contribute to eyelid twitching? Yes, uh, definitely. So dry eye is a common, common cause of twitching eyelids. Um, we call that um, eyelid myokymia, when you have like a little twitch on one eyelid, whether it's your lower lid or top lid. And oftentimes dry eye is one of the top um, uh, underlying root causes of that in addition to lifestyle issues, for example, lack of sleep, dehydration, stress, too much caffeine can also cause eyelid twitching, but dry eye is a big component of that. Yes. So, um, so we are almost at the end here. And again, you have about 30 seconds left to click that link if you're interested in joining us. We already have had a couple of people um, sign up. So uh, again, spots are limited. Please sign up if you're interested and get that special price of 63% off uh, with $299. Now, because you've stayed with me till the very, very end, um, I want to offer you two free gifts. One is my guide to the best dry eye products. And this is a um, an ebook that you can download for free. And in this, I will go through, I basically list out the drops that I recommend based off of the level of dry eye that somebody has. And there are some other products in there that can also be used for dry eye. So you can find all of that in the guide. And um, I'm gonna, gonna be um, having my staff just put into the link uh, into the chat, the link for that. So if you just click that, um, you can um, enter your email and then we will email that to you as a free gift. And then the last thing I just wanna mention is um, I actually have a book that I'm releasing soon. I wrote a book um, and it's, it's called Beyond Carrots, Best Foods for Eye Health A to Z. And in this book, I talk about um, all the nutrients our eyes need to stay healthy, not just carrots, but we need lots of nutrients from a diversity of foods. So I go through first what all those nutrients are. There are over 30 nutrients we need to keep our eyes healthy. And there are many, many foods to, that, that, that can provide us with those nutrients. There's over 40 foods. But basically I go through uh, in the alphabet A through Z, all of the great foods that can provide us with eye healthy nutrients. And um, this book is gonna be released in mid-January. It's gonna be available on Amazon. So if you pre-order the book, I'm gonna have my staff drop into the link, into the chat, the, the link to pre-order the book. If you pre-order the book, you will get the book at a discounted price. Plus you're gonna get some bonus materials. I have a cookbook that goes along with it. So you will get that cookbook for free. Now I'm really, really excited about this book. This is something I've been working on all last year and, uh, and hopefully um, uh, people will enjoy it. I'm also very, um, very excited because one of my patients, uh, Frank Bruni, who um, I don't know if you follow him, he's the New York Times reporter. He's also a best-selling author, New York Times best-selling author. Um, he wrote the forward for me for the book. So I'm really excited to have that out there. He's very kind to write that forward for me and um, really excited to get this information out there because right now uh, nutrition is just not a topic um, oftentimes talked about with patients uh, in terms of what they need for their eyes and unfortunately many eye doctors have not been properly trained in nutrition so um, so this in this book is designed not just for patients but for my colleagues in ophthalmology and optometry as well to help educate them about uh, which foods are most important which nutrients are most important so please pre-order the book and you'll get access to a discounted price and then the free, the free cookbook as well so with that 
I will be ending the webinar. Um, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I really apologize. I tried my best to stay on time, but there were questions and I just didn't want to cut back on the information that I shared with you. So that's why we went well, well, well over the hour mark. But thank you for staying on. And um, don't worry if you wanted to, you know, uh, watch this again, you will get a replay link in your email. So just stay tuned for that. Probably in the next uh, one to two days, you'll get a link uh, and you can watch it again and you can take notes and um, create your own roadmap for healthy vision for the years ahead. So again, thank you so much for joining me and I wish you all the best with your eye health for a lifetime of healthy vision ahead. So thank you.